Okay, um, we are going to finish the chapter on magnetism. It's a bit of a long haul from here to the end, um, so get yourself comfortable. Let's begin with a magnetic field um, created by a current. So finally we're getting to the other side of things instead of just feeling magnetic um, forces. Moving charges actually create magnetic fields. Um, and the first thing we'll do is a wire here. So a wire is, um, if it has a current in it, is a bunch of charges flowing, right? <clears throat> so it produces a magnetic field. It produces a magnetic field in a circle around itself. So um, if you put a bunch of compass needles in that picture, um, the north poles would point towards the, uh, the red arrows, right? All the way around in a circle. <clears throat> Okay, so there's a little visual there. There's a bunch of them, and they will be concentric circles moving outward from the wire, getting weaker and weaker the further away you get from the wire. So there's a second right-hand rule to show you the direction that is created by the current in a wire. You put your thumb in the direction of the current. It has you grasping the wire, that's okay. But your thumb is in the direction of the current, either up or down along the wire. Um, your thumb is in the direction of the current, and then your fingers curl, it be your right hand, got to be your right hand, curling in the direction of the field. If the current's going up, um, towards you this way, you get sort of a, what that be? Counterclockwise, down, give you a clockwise. <clears throat> um, as you get further away from the wire, the current gets weaker and weaker as a function of R, um, because it's a long, straight, infinitely long wire-ish. Um, it's 1 over R. So uh, the magnetic field is mu naught, which is a new constant for us. It's the permeability of free space rather than the permittivity of free space. They're sort of sister constants to each other, and the two of them together, put together in a special way, will give you the speed of light. But we're going to look at that later. So mu naught times the current divided by 2 pi divided by R. And that 2 pi thing should make you stop and wonder, why is pi involved? Um, and it's not an e there's no easy answer to that, um, something about the nature of our universe. And, and that's a p an interesting puzzle. It was in, notice it was also, it was in the permeability of free space, right? There was a 4 pi in there. So in this case, they cancel out. Um, but you have to have it in that um, mu naught. Okay. Two wires, um, parallel conductors. And you notice I1 and I2 are going in the same direction as each other. One of them, well, they each create a magnetic field. You don't feel the magnetic field created by yourself, okay? Um, the same as with particles. Um, so I1 creates a magnetic field that I2 feels, and I2 creates a magnetic field that I1 feels, and they exert a force on each other. So the force on wire 1 is due to the current from um, wire 2, right? Um, well, the current in wire 1 feels the magnetic field from wire 2 is the best way to think about it. So you get a force per unit length of wire um, involving mu naught, I1 and I2, again 2 pi, and d is the distance away from each other. This comes right out of um, the previous equation if you put the two together. Um, if you think about the magnetic field created by one and the magnetic field created by the other, and you know that the force... Um, the force on a charge as it relates to the the, the magnetic field. Right? But I'd write these down. Um, so that's the force per unit length. Each unit length feels that force. All right. <clears throat> this, these were carrying them in the same direction as each other, right? So... Um, when they're in the same direction, they attract each other. And you can use the right-hand rule. You need both right-hand rules, one to create the magnetic field and one V cross B to um, feel the magnetic force. And you'll see that both of them feel the force towards the other. If um, they are opposite currents, one going the other way, and you do the same math and use both right-hand rules, one to create the magnetic field and one to feel the magnetic force from that field, you will find that they repel each other. So, um, in this case, same directions attract and opposites repel. <clears throat> it's a little bit backwards from what you're used to. <clears throat> so the wire doesn't have to be straight. We're really going to look at two, the straight wire and the circular wire as an example. The circular wire gives us a nice, um, 
uh, a way to build a nice uniform magnetic field. So the strength inside a loop is created by the current at each little di, like a little, a little, each little piece of wire is sort of straight locally, and then you can add them all together, right? They're all going to give you that same, going to create a magnetic field at the center, all in the same direction as you go around. Is what's useful about it. So each little delta x segment, such as this one here, creates a magnetic field. You could use the previous um, equations to figure out the strength of that magnetic field and then add up a bunch all the way around. Or if you knew some calculus, you could take an integral to add up each little dx all the way around. Um, it's not a perfectly uniform magnetic field when you just have one loop of wire, but if you look at the center, it has a very strong straightness. It's very straight there. Curvy as you get closer to the wire itself. Um, and on the outside, fairly weak, and on the inside, fairly strong. Because outside here, um, on the inside, each piece is contributing in the same direction. On the outside, this piece and this piece are con contributing in opposite directions. Um, but this piece is much further away from this side, right? So uh, it doesn't cancel out, but it is weaker on the outside than it is on the inside. You get a strong magnetic field in the middle. So they just cut a piece of paper through this loop of wire through which they ran a current and threw some iron filings down so you can see the shape of the magnetic field there. All right, <clears throat> so we'll do the math for you. Um, the magnetic field uh, at the center of a loop of wire, if it's radius r and carrying current i, this is what you get. Um, the magnetic field is mu naught i over 2r. And then normally you would actually put a bunch of different loops, um, more than one. The more you put, the, the, the straighter and the stronger the magnetic field is the center. Everybody contributes inside, and everybody discontributes on the outside, I guess. And you get a very strong magnetic field inside, a very weak magnetic field outside, um, and a very straight magnetic field in the middle is the most important part. So each one, the superposition principle applies each loop um, in n numbers of loops contributes that mu naught i over 2r. So if you have 10 loops, you'll have 10 times that magnetic field, each one adding up. So the name for that um, geometry of wire with a current is called a solenoid. And we'll use that term quite a bit. It will definitely pop up. You want to write it down. A solenoid is many loops of wire all in a nice straight line. It kind of looks like a spring that hasn't been um, compressed or um, stretched. Uh, cool. Um, and in the middle you get the bumpy near the edge here, especially if you don't let these guys touch each other. If you bring them very, very close to each other, you get a nice straight magnetic field inside and a very, very weak magnetic field outside. Um, and you can turn it on and off. This is called an electromagnet. Uh, you turn it on and off, and uh, when there's no current, there's no magnetic field, and when there is a current, you get a very strong magnetic field. So we can control the shape and the size and the... Um, the on and offness of magnetic fields. All right. Um, very parallel, very uniform, same direction, um, very strong. That's the close together part, it means strength, right? Uniform and strong. And outside is non uniform and very weak. And in the opposite direction of the field that's inside the solenoid, that may or may not be important depending on what you're building and what you're up to. So here's a more traditional looking solenoid, and uh, it behaves, looks very much like a magnet. Um, just a North Pole, South Pole bar magnet sort of thing. But you can, unlike a bar magnet, you can't turn a bar magnet off, you can turn this on and off depending on how much current you have. And let's say you want it to be twice as strong, well, double the current, or one half the current. So you have complete control of the current, and therefore complete control of the strength of this magnetic field. So, um, the magnetic field inside the solenoid, if you're far from the ends, um, has a very constant strength. Mu naught n i, where n is the number of turns per unit length. So they took the number of turns divided by um, the unit length of the, the solenoid itself, not the length of the wire as it's curving, but if the, the solenoid is a meter long, and how many turns did you get per meter? So the tighter you wind that wire, the closer they are together, the stronger the magnetic field. So N is a, a turn density, a, a turn being each time you wind it, right? A winding density. So it's the number of loops per unit length, per length of the solenoid. So maybe you can get like three turns per centimeter or something like that. Um, Ampere's law, which we um, didn't focus on, but... Um, 
would would give you the same result. We're gonna get. Well, I don't know if we're gonna get to that actually. Um, <clears throat> all right, let's take a look. Here's our cross-sectional view. So here where you have X is the wire, the current is going in, and where you have the dots, the current is coming out. So the current is going like, like this down the wire, right? And we're going to um, put this imaginary surface in here and try to measure the magnetic field at each point. Ampere's law is the Gauss's law equivalent of four magnetic fields, but I don't think we actually covered it properly, so I'm not sure why I didn't delete that slide. Um, it's not terribly important. All right. <clears throat> so it turns out the reason that magnetism exists is because of what's going on in the atoms themselves. Each individual atom is a magnet. I mean, it behaves like a magnet, um, some more than others because... Uh, of the number of electrons. So each electron orbital, each electron is a current running around an atom, right? It, it orbits the nucleus of the atom and it's going in a certain direction and it creates a little circular current which gives you a magnetic field at the center. Now you get a bunch of them added together. Now for most atoms the, the orbits sort of cancel out, some going the other way, but if you have an odd number of them or um, an just the way the orbitals are shaped, you sometimes, well, you'll always get a net magnetic field, but sometimes it'll be stronger than others. So certain atoms have a much stronger magnetic field individually than others. Um, they're going very quickly, so the, the current is very, very low charge, but a very, very high speed, so the current is decent. Um, 1.6 milliamps um, creates about 20 Teslas at the center of the circular path. However, this doesn't happen often with, um, because they're all canceling out with each other, right? So you don't actually, it doesn't like add up. If they're all going the same direction, everything would be crazy magnetic, but they're all going opposite directions, canceling each other out. So you think about a hydrogen atom, it only has one, right? So if you had a bunch of hydrogen together, um, say in liquid form, it would be crazy magnetic, except for all the atoms are going in other directions, right? So, but it would be very easy to line those guys up. And in fact, liquid and hydrogen has um, amazing magnetic properties, but it's hard to produce. Um, you don't find it very often. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of canceling out going on. The net result is you get very little in ordinary materials, like a... Oops. Um, in ordinary materials, you don't get a very strong magnetic field. So the electrons themselves individually have a spin. They're spinning and have a um, kind of like a top. So they, they produce a magnetic field themselves with their spinningness. But this um, gives them a little magnetic moment up or down. Because it doesn't create a strong magnetic field in any scenario. But it does make them susceptible to magnetic fields. You can put electrons in magnetic fields and then, and then have them flip up and down. Um, this is a cool way to to study um, elementary particles um, and quantum mechanics. It's specifically a quantum mechanic effect. <clears throat> um, generally, the field due to the spinning is stronger than due to the orbital motion, but um, once again, they're canceling each other out. Electrons almost always pair up, spin up, and spin down. Again, that makes hydrogen kind of unique with its properties because there's only one electron. So, uh, But this hydrogen atom and this hydrogen atom, the odds are one will be up and one will be spin down. So you have to force them into that um, matching up in order to make a strong magnet out of uh, liquid hydrogen. So most materials aren't naturally magnetic. So let's talk about how this happens. So what happens in a material is things are created called domains, where the spins don't cancel. Um, in such a material where the domains can be lined up, where the um, valence electrons of the um, atoms can be all sort of moved into the same direction, are called ferromagnets. And when they're moved into the same direction, the ones that are near each other sort of hold each other in that direction. The, the magnetic field generated by all of its compatriots will sort of force everybody else not everybody else, um, a large number of them into the same uh, direction. So iron is very, uh, is magnetizable because these electrons can be lined up in large groups called domains. 
and things that are frozen that way, permanent magnets, um, were had say the Earth's magnetic field in them while the while the um, the rock or whatever it was was um, going from magma liquid to solid, and then it freezes in that place, and you get a, a nice permanent magnet. Um, so, as the stronger the magnetic field you add to it, the more of them line up, and the more stable it becomes, because the ones next to each other are, are sort of holding each other in position, north end to south end, right? But this also means they can be um, unmade. By smacking the metal, it sort of jars them. <clears throat> okay, so... Um, on the left, you've got random alignment. It's very difficult for the human eye to see this, I know. Um, on the right, you'll see the arrows are more often than not um, facing mostly left. Um, and that actually creates a, a magnetic field the other way. <clears throat> I know we've seen that before, like in the Earth's magnetic field. Um, what you're calling, where your, mag where your compass points is to the south magnetic pole, right? Um... Yeah, when that external field is applied, these things line up. Um, this is microscopic and submicroscopic, but what's happening here? All right. So you align them, and then you remove the magnetic field, and if the material stays aligned, um, then it's a permanent magnet. Um, permanent, there are ways probably to demagnetize it, uh, but the material itself um, doesn't happen naturally over short amounts of time. It stays in, um, lined up well. Um, a soft magnetic material demagnetizes easily, like ther this is thermal agitation. Basically, the heat is just the molecules bouncing into each other, so that smacking can sort of disalign things um, and very quickly returns to an unmagnetized state. So it's not a good thing to use for your hard drive, say. Um, so the more... Um, if you give more magnetic field you apply, the, the harder the magnetic material, the, the stronger the magnet will be and the longer it will last. So ferromagnetic um, become magnetized easily. Paramagnetic have um, moments that align with the external magnetic fields, but very weakly compared to... Um, ferromagnetic material, so just sort of very weak magnetic fields. And diamagnetic um, produces a, a weak magnetic field in the opposite direction of the field applied, which is more interesting. So that has more to do with the molecules moving rather than the, um, the moments of the, of the metal lining up. <clears throat>